Uh, my name is John, and I'm the local engagement pastor, uh, lead here at Crossroads. Now, I've had a few folks uh, ask me in this last year, so if you don't have much to do with Sunday morning, then what do you actually do? Well, other than drink a lot of coffee, uh, I wear kind of three hats-ish. And a disclaimer, uh, none of them is preacher. So, As a local engagement lead, it's my joy to be a bridge for some great partners in our community that we serve alongside and to help us get connected with those partners, uh, even to try to train some of us how to be effective with them. Now, that's what all the commotion is about in the lobby when you came in, and we're going to talk more about that in, in a few minutes. I also lead our Agape team. If you've been in the church world long, you've probably heard about a benevolence ministry. Uh, that's where folks uh, who call Crossroads home can get help with bills and such. And our Agape team is led by volunteer team, which does an amazing job of walking alongside folks through some of the harder points in life. I also lead the Unity and Reconciliation team, and it's our job to bridge divides and, uh, across ethnic, economic, and educational divides, and to try to take down barriers to folks who may be walking across those bridges uh, from all kinds of directions, both inside our church and to help us equip, uh, equip us to go out. Uh, the Unity concert in February was one of those opportunities uh, that we spearheaded. Now, we're in a series uh, about what real love looks like. Last week, Phil took us on a journey exploring what the Old Testament describes as God's love, his has said, his long-term kind love toward us. We could say that real love is when we don't settle for short-term bursts of affection, but instead we settle into a patient, caring connection for the long haul. We could say that real love loves long. Now, this week, we're going to shift our focus uh, toward a love that's not just long, but it's wide too. If we are to live in love like Jesus, our vision can't simply be to love people and communities who look like us, talk like us, and think like us. Real love loves wide too. Coming out of the COVID fog, uh, if that's where we're at, <laughs> many of us have been reassessing life. Some of us have changed jobs. Uh, I was one of them. Now, what we've been hearing a lot about has been this career change, but I think there's something more seismic going on within our culture. Not just the great resignation, but the great reassessment. I think a lot of people are asking some really hard questions. So many of us have tried to maybe reprioritize our time. So we've been trying to spend more time with our kids or go visit our parents more often. Maybe we've even tried to pick up a new hobby. My wife became a plant person during lockdown. So now we live in a big leafy greenhouse, basically. Now, did all this well-intended reassessment lead to lasting change? Did it lead to living and loving like Jesus? better? Well, for some of us, maybe. But the reality of life post-COVID also has put us face-to-face -face with some really old issues. It seems like forever ago and just yesterday that the summer of 2020 hit us like a ton of bricks. We saw our community move toward polarities politically, racially, and socially. All our reassessments were put on the backseat as everyone in our culture seemed to get angry and choose a side. We were divided about what caused these issues and even more divided about what to do about it. Some viewed police as an evil to be removed and some viewed them as our saviors and the only thing standing in the way of total social collapse. It was a tense summer. The chants in the street were no justice, no peace. The slogan is an interesting double entendre. The person holding this sign probably was saying that they were going to keep causing unpeace until justice was served. Now, this idea came from a speech from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1965. He famously said that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, but it's the presence of justice. And the protesters may or may not have understood this, but MLK's quote is slightly broader than the sign's meaning. 
MLK was saying that peace isn't just the absence of war, that true peace can only come through the application of justice because peace is broader than that. MLK's quote is actually a deeply rooted biblical idea. Now, I hope that following the protests, the folks holding these signs went to work bringing lasting peace to their communities because I think MLK intended to do both, to call out injustice, and to work toward lasting peace. But we got to ask this question, what does peace look like? I mean, it's a slippery topic that's more often defined by its absence than its presence. The Old Testament word most often translated as peace is shalom. Many of us may recognize this. If you've been around somebody who speaks Jewish or Arabic in their home, then you've probably been greeted by this word. It's so embedded in Jewish culture that the capital of Israel, Jerusalem, is literally the city of peace. Salem is a shortened version of shalom. It's used as both a noun and a verb over 300 times in the Old Testament and 150 in the New. And basically those two languages, it's interchangeable words. It's used in every genre of writing in the Bible. So to say that this was a pervasive idea throughout Scripture is an understatement. Well, if it's talked about so much, then why do we talk about it so little? Well, today we're going to get to look at the breadth of peace as it's used in the Old Testament. Again, one Hebrew word, but we use dozens of English words and and phrases to bring it into our language. This kind of makes it a challenge to wrap our minds around. Then like skipping a stone across a pond, we get to trace peace through the entirety of the Bible. Don't worry, I, I will get you out before lunch. It's all good. The theme of peace is an undercurrent throughout all of God's story. And finally, we're going to look through the lens of peace to see what it might look like to be part of growing biblical peace in our relationships in our, and in our community. Now, the most common way that we talk about peace is as the cessation of war. In this usage, a country and its people experience peace when violence stops. Now, sometimes when you read about that in the Bible, peace in the Bible, it's also talking about this kind of peace. But that's not the only way the biblical authors understood it. Now, let me share with you a couple examples of when shalom is translated into English in different ways than we would use it today. So a wall had peace when the final brick in the wall was put in place. A rock that was large and uncut was considered at peace. When you look around your house and nothing is missing and everything is in its proper place, the house is at peace. When a cow trampled a neighbor's field, the owner of the cow had to restore peace by paying restitution for what the animal damaged. The restitution itself was called peace. Now, the way the biblical writers understood peace was obviously well outside of how we think of it. The Bible Project has done a great study on this word, and they narrowed it down to two central ideas that we're going to refer to often today. And if you want to watch their little video about it, it'll be in the notes on uh, YouVersion. But the core of what they were talking about, they considered it whole and complete as a definition for peace. Now, let's tease this out for a second in a real-world scenario. Let's think about the war in Ukraine. When will peace return to Ukraine? Will it be when the bullets stop flying? Will it be when there's a peace treaty signed? Will that be enough to make Ukraine whole and complete again? So what does peace look like for this lady and her cat. Look at the devastation behind her. Now, these folks obviously want the bullets to stop flying, but if Putin grabs his tanks, goes back to Moscow and is like, "My, my bad, does that make this lady's life whole and complete? I don't think so. And what about that pesky usage of the word peace as restitution? Cow for a cow? There's not enough restitution in the world, is there, to return a son who's been killed in combat to his mother? What would Putin need to do for Ukraine to bring Ukraine back to peace? 
And peace may be a fleeting reality in our current world, but when we look into the Bible, it starts off with a vision of complete and perfect shalom. The Garden of Eden existed in wholeness and completeness. It lacked nothing and functioned as a perfect system. The ecosystem worked just like it was intended. Plants did their things, animals played their role, and Adam and Eve were caretakers of the garden. They were there to get the best out of it. They were tasked with creatively unfolding the embedded beauty and potential of their surroundings. They were in tune with each other, and both Adam and Eve related to God without any barriers. In the garden, everything worked like it was designed to. But that was all shattered by a force that wrecked everything. Adam and Eve exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and this wrecked not only their individual relationships with God and each other, but later in the Bible, it was written that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth from that day onward. We broke God's peaceful garden, and our brokenness threw everything out of whack. Sin immediately went to work creating unshalom everywhere. God's original command of be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and bring the best from it, quickly devolved. The first couple had their first fight. The first death of an animal created a way to cover the shame that they immediately associated with their bodies. The first sibling rivalry led to the first murder. The first exile from that murder led to the forming of a community where violence was the norm. That same community became a city that openly boasted about sexual violence. And it got so bad that the entire population of the whole earth had basically committed to a lifestyle of unshalom. The Bible commented this way. It said that the thoughts and intentions of their heart were evil all the time. I would say that's unshalom. Except one family who survived in a big boat. The boat was so big that the picture the Bible paints of it is almost like a little floating Eden. And when they got off the boat, surely they'd embrace peace, right? <laughs> Not so much. After leaving the boat, Noah got messy drunk and something happened that wrecked that family. We're not totally sure what it was, but it was not pretty at all. Unshalom raised its ugly head again. Let's fast forward. Years later, God decided to partner with Abraham and his kids. And then several hundred years later, God was working in the nation of Israel and trying to get their leaders to follow him. The problem was the leaders didn't want to. And the leaders of his chosen people were a pretty big mess. So God sent prophets to remind his people of his grand vision for them, essentially reminding them of what peace looked like and that he had not left them alone, but that he had always had a plan. You probably recognize this verse from Christmas time, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that day on and forever. Here's the challenge, right? Any plan will never work if it doesn't defeat the very enemy that always defeats us. And that's sin. Isaiah kind of understood that. He envisioned that this prince of peace would gain victory, but in a very unusual way. He would be pierced and crushed and punished. That it would actually be his wounds that would bring us healing. This prince of peace arrived on earth in the first century as a miracle-working Jewish rabbi named Jesus, who was and is God. Through his life, Jesus was the perfect human and showed us how to live at peace with each other, with him, and with our world. Now, after Jesus returned to heaven, the apostle Paul tried to explain this dynamic to the first Christians when he wrote that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. In another letter, Paul wrote that Jesus is our peace. 
You see, Isaiah's vision of the Prince of Peace was made real in and through Jesus. This king offers individual internal peace through a relationship with him, but he also offers us peace with each other and our communities if we follow his lead. Now, when we normally talk about peace, it's a facet of our faith, right? Inner peace is having a contentment that doesn't seem to make sense. It's the peace that passes understanding. But the Bible's framework for peace isn't limited to our internal experience. It affirms it, but it's not limited to it. So keeping in mind the breadth and depth of peace, we're now going to turn our attention to what growing peace in our world might look like today. I'm going to put my hats back on and offer three different ways that we can all take part in growing shalom in messy relationships, cross-cultural reconciliation, and with neighbors in neighborhoods. Peace can be grown even in messy situations. Our agape team works with folks through hard patches of life. Now, many of the people who apply for assistance have very little depth and defense in their lives. Their families and communities don't know how to support them, or they simply don't exist. So it would be a simple view of folks who are asking the church for assistance to look through the lens of fault, as in, it's their fault, they made bad choices. The problem is that choices are obviously part of the equation, but it doesn't paint the whole picture, does it? Now, it's ironic that I lead this team because I grew up in a small church in Northeast Ohio where my family were the the recipients of much benevolence. I remember getting turkeys on Thanksgiving and waking up in the middle of cold Ohio nights in the basement when our furnace had died. And very often, someone showed up from the church and fixed our furnace even before the light of day. Fowler Community Church, my home church, was a place of amazing generosity and still is. Now, it would have been easy to add up the simple facts of my family. My dad lost his job as a teacher when I was around eight and took a job making minimum wage as a night watchman just to try to make the ends meet. My mother was the custodian of our church uh, because dad didn't want her to work in a job. Uh, I'm not sure why the church didn't count, but uh, I was just happy to have a little more. I spent much of my early life licking food stamps when they were stamps that had to be licked (laughs) and standing in line for cheese that had no properties that resembled actual cheese. (laughs) And many of us, if uh, we've been there, would remember that. Many viewed my family as poor and stuck. What they didn't know, though, is that the general focal point of that stuckness, my dad, is that people saw it from the outside, had had a stroke the year before that I was born, was undiagnosed at that point, threw him off. He has ever since had trouble with, shall we say, emotional regulation. And to put it like I felt it, he got mad a lot. Now, Dad has always loved us, and he's loved baseball too, but few people knew that he loved baseball because the last memory he had of his father before he walked away from his family was going to a Pirates game at the old Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, where he was from. Dad didn't know how to be a dad because he didn't have one to learn it from. Now, you would not have been wrong to observe that my family often struggled financially, but without getting close to us, you'd have never known why. Anytime we maintain a distance from a challenge, the solution seems clear and simple. The closer you get to a challenge, though, the more complex the problem becomes. This is why bringing shalom into our real world is so challenging. Its breadth moves us out of our simple answers and into the complexities of living and loving like Jesus in our broken world. From where I sit each Sunday, there are a lot of us who come here and love it. Some of us feel unseen. Maybe it's because our lives are a little bit messier than we view other people's lives, which I think generally is an overstatement. But maybe it's also because we're shy or maybe because we're not sure that if we can trust church folks or white folks or rich folks. 
All of that is understandable and okay, but we have a chance each week to see someone here who we don't know and introduce ourselves. And that's not because we're viewing them as a project, but because we just don't know them yet. This kind of love is exactly how Jesus lived his life and the vision the Bible that paints of real peace. Jesus wasn't afraid to get close and personal with our challenges. Let's do that for others. Peace can be grown also across whatever divides us. Now, let me put on my unity and reconciliation hat for a couple minutes. Now, this is one of our church's five focal points this year. Uh, we have a great group of folks who are, f- are, formed, are forming a strategy and a plan for helping our church build bridges across racial divides and remove barriers to folks coming into our church. We also got some uh, thoughts about how to equip each of us to have some skills to be able to do that in our own relationships and community. It's a huge task, and one that I can't assume that all of us are necessarily on board with. So let's start with a passage in which an early church leader, Paul, linked peace and reconciliation. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. For Jesus is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. The pur- his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, this passage may be confusing if you don't know who the group, two groups are that he's talking to. Now, Jewish folks divided the world around them into us's and them's. In the Bible, you read a lot about Jews and Gentiles. Well, a Gentile was any non-Jewish person. So a Jew and Gentile would encompass the entire world. Now, imagine being Paul that it's trying to grow a church in a city where people who don't look alike, talk alike, or think alike, and you're starting with a group of people who live life in a simplistic ethnic binary of us and them. Now, what was the barrier wall that Paul was referring to here? Well, it might have been two things that maybe are a little bit conjoined, but a little bit different. At the time that Paul was writing this, there was a literal wall in the Jewish temple that divided the section of the temple that was for Jewish dudes and that was for Gentiles. He probably was talking about this wall, literally. But there's also something metaphorical that he's talking about. Here's what one commentator said about what Paul was expressing here. He said, what Paul really expresses then is the fact that the Jewish legal system, which was meant primarily to protect the Jewish people against the corruption of heathen idolatry, became the bitter root of Jewish exclusiveness in relation to the Gentiles. The Jewish law was seen as a wall that kept Jewish folks from becoming like the nations around them. What was originally meant to bring order and morality became the litmus test of their ethnic authenticity. If you were a good Jewish person, you would do the stuff the law told you. But the law was not meant to be that. It was meant to point people toward God, not to define who's in and out and who's better than others. Thus, their obedience didn't lead to humility, but it led to superiority. Now, the same could be said of the Gentiles of Ephesus. How did they feel about the Jewish folks around them? Well, check out what the ancient Roman historian Tacitus wrote about the Jewish people. All their customs, which are at once perverse and disgusting, owe their strength to their very badness. The most degraded out of other races, they regard the rest of mankind with all the hatred of enemies. They sit apart at meals, they sleep apart, and though as a nation they are singularly prone to lust, they abstain from intercourse with foreign women. Among themselves, nothing is unlawful. I mean, that's a pretty rough statement, isn't it? We would say today that's directly anti-Semitic and racist. We would never have any of that kind of stuff written today, would we? Well, consider what was behind several recent mass shootings. The shooter at the Buffalo Tops believed a theory that used to reside in the recesses of the internet, but in the last couple of years, it's popped up in several violent places. 
The shooter at a mosque in New Zealand wrote about it, as did Dylan Roof, who shot up Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina a few years ago. The theory goes something like this, that there are forces in our country and our world who are moving black and brown people into white places to replace white folks. Some believe it's to sway voting. Some believe that it's part of a one world government and conspiracy kind of thing. The way many folks describe this perspective is eerily similar to the rhetoric used in Nazi Germany or pre-genocide Rwanda. This is no longer a fringe idea. It's getting airtime on some major news channels. There are very popular hosts who often flirt with this. This belief pits people groups against people groups. It pushes people to believe that they need to defend their turf from those who look different than them. This is the antithesis of the good news of the Prince of Peace. This is not bringing wholeness and completeness to our culture. The good news is that We don't have to agree with all the stuff that floats around around the internet, do we? We have peace with God through Jesus. And we can and should have peace with each other through Jesus. But how would that be possible? Well, the linchpin word that Paul used here was reconcile. Reconcile means to reconnect to what's been severed. It's an essential part of the process of peacemaking and uniquely offered to us through unity around Jesus. But this is not a kind of unity that demands uniformity. You don't give up your uniqueness to be part of us. The vision is of a salad, not a soup. Reconciliation brings out the beauty in cultural diversity by bringing together what's been segregated for generations. Reconnecting what's severed means valuing the image of God in everyone. It means listening well. It means being willing to tell the truth about both our places in our world and our shared history. It means reassessment from both a me and a we perspective. This process works horizontally like it does vertically. In salvation, we begin by confessing the truth about God and us. As in, I'm a sinner who is helpless and hopeless to overcome my situation. I need a savior. This is what I grew up thinking and understanding as the sinner's prayer. And probably many of us began our relationship with God in a similar way. But when we look at reconciliation in our relationships, we have to also start by telling the truth. Why should we expect the process between each other to be different than the process between us and God? Grace without truth results in the appearance of reconciliation without the substance of honesty. The challenge for many of us is that we simply don't know our shared history. So as part of our Love Our City event, we're going to be adding a new kind of team an exploration team. If you'd like to learn more about the history of our city and take your own step toward understanding racial reconciliation, you're invited to join me and my friend, Reverend Floyd Edwards of Mount Olive Galilee Baptist Church for a tour of the Evansville African American Museum and a lunch and learn immediately afterwards. We'll be joined by members of his church and have a chance to begin connections that will help us live out this vision of whole and complete relationships across cultures. This will be led by our Unity and Reconciliation team. If anyone would like to chat with any of us, you can find more about our team's work, our resources, and who's on the team at cccgo.info. Now, the good news about reconciliation is that Jesus made it possible, the Spirit empowers it, and we can grow in it. These are all skills we can learn, and our hearts can grow. If we want to take real love, uh, offer real love, we're going to have to widen our love to include people who don't look like us, talk like us, and think like us. That's a critical step toward a whole and complete vision for relationships. Now, if this is a new conversation for you, and honestly, it gives you a little heartburn, I'd love to chat with you. I realize that these are not common topics brought up in church, but I'd love to hear more about your story and further explore what the Bible says about being a church who is sent to love and serve others. The final perspective I'd like to share looks through the lens of peace in our community. Peace isn't just an individual experience, but through scripture is presented as a collective experience too. Is your neighborhood experiencing wholeness and completeness? That's a hard question to answer, isn't it? So let me offer some ideas by looking at a section of our city that many of us have invested in. 
The top circle on this map is where I live. Uh, I have a wonderful home there. Just above this odd-looking triangle is shape. Uh, for over 10 years, our church has deliberately focused on the neighborhoods of TP Park, Aiken Park, Goose Town, Glenwood, and some of Culver. Glenwood Leadership Academy is a central rallying point for, for us. GLA is a K-8 through school that pulls children from all these neighborhoods. So why this triangle-ish area? Well, as a church, we prioritize moving toward the least reached and the most vulnerable. These folks tend to live in neighborhoods with the least wholeness and completeness. But why this community? Well, this area had and has the highest per capita poverty rate in the city. When we started, it had the lowest amount of outside investment coming in. This has hopefully changed for the better. Glenwood Leadership Academy had some of the lowest test scores in EVSC, but that's no longer the case. They're bucking the trend of schools and under-resourced communities by improving slightly over the last three years. This area had and has the highest rental rates in the city and the highest percentage of unoccupied homes. This too has shifted toward the positive, but there's a lot of work still to be done on this front. Now, I, I understand that this feels overwhelming, but many of you have invested many hours into the triangle. And these neighborhoods have bright spots of emerging wholeness and completeness in them. One of our partners, Potter's Wheel, had a quarter of all the students at GLA in their after-school programs this past year. These students received help with their homework and received relational encouragement to succeed in school. And they heard the life-changing message of Jesus. Another one of our partners, Community One, is actively renovating three homes in one block along Kentucky Avenue. These houses were in severe disrepair and were basically unsellable. They've gutted them and are rebuilding them to be viable homes for families. They'll be sold slightly below market value to vetted families who will own this home and will pour back in their community. Our teams, our, our church's team connected to GLA that's led by Patty Lehe did nine different events at GLA this past year. We began the school year by providing school supplies for the 400 plus students that call GLA home. We ended the year with a week-long food extravaganza for teacher appreciation. We helped provide Christmas presents and started a snack pantry. And many of us showed up a lot. Now, the goal of all this work is to empower neighbors to rise up and lead neighborhoods under the banner of the Prince of Peace. So let me be clear, just because we've invested 10 years of relationships and resources in this area doesn't make us their savior. That's Jesus. The triangle is simply the best way that we know how to live out God's calling for our church, to live in love like Jesus among the least reached and the most vulnerable. Everyone who came in today should have received this card. All our Love Our City teams are on the card. A bunch of these teams are serving with these partners on the south side. But there are opportunities all over our city. It's our prayer that within this short serve that God will move our hearts to connect for the long haul. Now, you'll also see info for our school supply drive. That's happening right now. Please grab a brown, brown bag on the way out and fill it up with school supplies and bring it back so that kids at Glenwood Leadership Academy don't have to stress about school supplies when they go back to school. And if you turn the card over, you'll see other opportunities to pursue that you, your family, or your small group can do anytime. But that Sunday, Sunday the 7th, August 7th, we've set aside uh, that special morning to do these kind of things. There will not be church here in this building that, the, that morning. Instead, we're going to be the church in our community. And you can also be sure to join us for a time of connection and celebration that begins at 4 p.m. that day at Friedman's Park. So as we leave here today, let's go live in love like Jesus, not just long, but wide. <laughs>